kamu pernah nggak BAB yang nggak keluar keluar keras banget ya pernah lah ini nah kamu ngeden ngeden menghadap ke sana nanti kalau saya kasih tanda kamu menoleh dan ketakutan ah itu Welcome to Foreign Film Club, Vice's guide to creative, outrageous, and unexpected cinema around the world. In this series, we'll introduce you to filmmakers working far from the major industries, making films for their own audiences, on their own terms, and developing a unique cinematic language in the process. In this episode, we look back at Indonesian exploitation cinema of the 1980s, in which genre films mixed outrageous gore, imaginative low-budget visuals, and charismatic B-movie acting to delirious effect. The New Order era in Indonesia is defined as the phase between 1966 and 1998, in which military strongman General Suharto ruled the country. And while any direct criticism of the corrupt regime was strictly prohibited, the government relaxed censorship laws for exploitation films. In response, genre filmmakers relished the freedom to violate the boundaries of taste and common sense in ways that helped them cope with the repression of daily life. The golden age of Indonesian pulp cinema lasted for almost 20 years and then ended abruptly in 1997. Our guide to the world of Indonesian exploitation cinema is Joko Anwar, a director who's part of a current new wave in Indonesian film, and who grew up loving the exploitation films of the 80s. He met us at the Grand Theatre, formerly one of Jakarta's premier movie palaces, now a ruined shell of its former glory. Well, I was born in uh, 1976. The society at the time was very into films. I remember going together with my neighbors, my friends and my families, watching Indonesian films. This was the best time of my life. You can see from the screen, it was massive love for the craft, whatever it was, and massive effort to please the audience. At that time, it was not easy to produce film that has serious tone, especially when it involves politics. Most of these filmmakers thought that they just could produce genre films in which the censorship was not that tight. They can put violence. <laughs> High quotient of blood and gore. <laughs> Sexual innuendos. And sometimes they can put nipples also. But back then, there were no Islamic groups pressing any movies to be taken down from theaters. Most of these films were produced by Rapi films, by the Sorai Interesting Films. Rapi Studios was the biggest and most prolific of the Indonesian genre studios, which created between 50 to 60 films during its apex in the 1980s, usually budgeted around $150,000 to $200,000 some of which were released on the international market. The company was founded by Gope Samtani and his brother, sons of an Indian family that had been successful in the textile industry. I was interested in films since my school days. I used to go to the studio to see the shooting and so on, so that made me like decide that's my business. 1968, we started Rapi Films. And 71, we did our first production. Jangan tinggalkan aku, Tony. Indonesia is, you know, I they believe in black magic. magic. They believe in mystics. So even though that, you know, they feel scared after they see the movie, and still they want to watch it. And we, we always show that, you know, good always conquers evil. The Indonesian, like a priest type of man, he will read the verses of Quran and try to drive away the ghost. Thank you. 
Imam Tamtawi is the foremost screenwriter of the New Order exploitation era. Over the course of his career, he wrote more than 30 scripts and directed 18 films, winning the Indonesian version of the Oscar for both screenwriting and directing. Saya menulis senario dari tahun 70-an. Saya menulis film-film mistik seperti Ratu Ilmu Hitam, kemudian film actionnya seperti film Jaga Sembung. Yang waktu itu ada kepala terpenggal tapi masih bisa hidup, menyatu kembali. Rapi film itu sangat bebas untuk anu. Yang penting ide itu masuk akal untuk bisa menangguk penonton. Dia akan welcome. Penonton itu selalu menengah bawah, selalu. Mereka yang mau menonton film-film anu, film-film horor, film-film genre begitu. Itu paling mudah dan paling murah, itu kan. They use materials that are not usually used for special effects for films, like chicken feathers or stuff that they can find very easily in, in Indonesia. And this creates spectacle, entertainment that, that is very outrageous for audience at the time, and people love it. As art director, El Badrun was responsible for the outrageously gruesome special effects that were a calling card of the genre. Today, his visual effects workshop is still operational, creating props for TV soap operas. Ayo, kita ke tempat properties. Saya lihat orang bikin senjata. Ada senjata asli, ada senjata palsu. <laughs> Smoke. <laughs> terlalu panas begini ya. Ya, ini dengan ini yang tanpa ini seperti ini ini. Duh, bes. Bisa satu di sini. Duh. Belakangnya keluar ini kan. Di ratu ilmu hitam waktu itu yang main Alan ya, Alan kalau saya. Di Alan itu saya begini. Ini kan enggak ada kelihatan kepala. Kamera di sini. Ini saya pasang di sini, saya pasang lem, karet, latex, segala macam. Baru orangnya saya gerak, wah, 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 tarik, wah, karetnya mekar, ras, lepas, darah, mau pak, slow, 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 darah, ras. Itu teknik dulu. Tolong, tolong. Kalangan menengah ke bawah menyukai hal-hal yang sifatnya berantem, darah, jiji, ataupun yang mengerikan itu mungkin sebagai hiburan aja. Ketika kita membuat gimmick-gimmick seperti itu gitu ya, kalau misalnya keluar darah atau tadi tangan yang keluar urat-urat darahnya atau mungkin perut yang meletus atau mungkin dari perut bisa keluar bayi, tiga bayi, tiga bayi yang mukanya jelek-jelek seperti raksasa dengan gigi-gigi yang e, runcing, kan itu mau jadi daya tarik gitu. Penonton suka yang kayak gitu, takut tapi suka gitu. I saw many kung fu films, but they did not have outrageous violence like in Jaka Sembung. And they put everything they could. They gouge eyes, they cut limbs and everything. The New Order era created its own cinematic icons, of which Taekwondo martial artist Barry Prima was one of the most unexpectedly charismatic and beloved. Among with other Rapi productions, he starred in the seminal New Order exploitation classic Jaka Sembung, or The Warrior. Kalau Barry Prima, saya asisten saudara pada waktu itu, tapi saya yang justru menarik dia dari tadinya anak berandalan di Bandung, saya bawa ke Jakarta. Dia tidak mengerti acting, dia tidak mengerti apa. Dan saya melatih dia tidak dengan metode actingnya Stanislavski atau Boleslavski. 
In a later interview, Barry claimed that he never made a good film because the scripts had always been bad and the budgets too low, though he also recalled enjoying his time as an actor. <laughs> Barry's co-star in his second film was Susanna, the horror queen of Indonesian cinema, an acclaimed actress who often inhabited the role of witches, spirits and demons with otherworldly detachment. Even until now, there were no comparison to her. She was really able to put her own style. She did not imitate any characters from Western. So even though we saw her as a ghost character, but she always shows fragility, so we can relate to her. Maafkan aku, Mas. Aku telah membunuh mereka semua yang merusak kebahagiaan kita. Her off-screen affinity for the occult only deepened her mystical aura. She had love for mystics. When she shot the film, she used to go to this room there dedicated to the Lady of the Seas to get uh, blessings. Makan melati dan sebagainya. Atau mungkin itu juga teknik dia untuk melawan persaingan itu kan. Menghadapi dia seperti menghadapi primadona. Susanna appeared in over 40 films before passing away in 2008 at age 66. Rappi Studios released at least 20 films on the international market that were dubbed into English and incorporated the efforts of variably talented American actors. Their biggest hit, Final Score in 1986, could be considered the peak of Indonesian exploitation cinema. People were amazed. We could sell this like uh, Jaka Sambung. We changed the title to The Warrior, and we could make good sales for uh, foreign countries. Could sell for America, North America, then we could sell for Germany, Italy, all over Europe, Asia, everywhere was sold. No, please. <laughs> Bobby says hello too. Some of them bought by American distributors uh, screen in underground cinemas, but not because of the high quality, but because of the unique quality of it. But then after that again, we were hit with the crisis. The dollar from 2000 shot to 16,000. The Asian financial crisis of 1997 destroyed several industries and wiped out much of the disposable income of the Indonesian lower middle class. Coupled with the rise of free-to-air television, which featured a glut of imported programming, it led to the rapid decline of popular Indonesian cinema. At the time, Indonesian audience could see that there were many good films that they could watch on TV for free. And they began to question, why did they have to watch Indonesian films? They think filmmaking can be done lazily. So little effort, the least effort that they put. Enggak diperhatikan masalah menjaga penonton. Sehingga akibatnya tahu sendiri gitu loh. Kita harus ngulang dari nol lagi, ngumpulin penonton lagi. Nah, saya beralih ke televisi dengan segala keterkejutannya. Kemudian udah ribuan ribuan cerita. Saya kan tinggal menyelesaikan sisa umur aja. After two decades of sporadic output, 2017 seems to have marked an unexpected resurgence of Indonesian film, with ticket sales up by 23% and a new wave of young filmmakers creating personal, artistic films, some of which even directly reference the joyful creative madness of their forefathers in the New Order exploitation cinema. Movies like The Warrior, Jaka Sembong series, Susanna's films, all of these films, they are very endearing. My second film, Kala, was actually my love letter to exploitation cinemas 
from 70s and 80s from Indonesia. The ending was pretty much borrowed from martial art films in the 80s where you could see a heroine holding a big sword and smashing everybody's. So this is like a reminder of the golden age of Indonesian cinema. Hey! <laughs>